Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, this is I'm Stacy. Oh, my name's on there. You know what? Glad you could all join us today. I thought we'd have about five people. We've got 17 people coming on. Wow. And Larry, I see you there. Thank you for joining us. So um, let me go ahead and get started. I'm Stacy Sacco. I'm a professor at UNM. I teach entrepreneurial studies at the Small Business Institute. We've been doing some workshops for the STC. Now, right now, Cecilia is also joining us from STC, so she's going to manage some of the graphics behind the scenes. She's put all of you on mute. I think each of you, if you, well, there's a couple of ways for you to chime in here or ask questions. One, you can use the chat uh, page. I'm also okay with, if you want to, un I think you can unmute yourself and then come on in and then ask a question so we can make this more interactive. Wow, we've got 20 people. Who knew? So uh, let me flip over to my slides and I'll get started here. One of the ideas we had in the beginning about having this workshop was to talk about the steps that you go through and different documents you need for uh, starting a business. So I need to tell you right up front, I'm not a lawyer. I asked uh, one of my lawyer friends, Larry, to be online with us. So I may have him say a word or two about, or jump in anywhere in here, Larry, uh, if I'm getting off track. <laughs> but, um, you know, I can't really give legal advice. So I put a disclaimer on this first page, just so you all know. Um, with the intent that I'll give you some background information and what you need to do to start a business, some of the documents you need to uh, get collected together and sign up for. From my experience of working at, I worked at West as a regional manager. And so I would help people get started. And I also, I teach at UNM and I have a policy. If I have any students do anything or I ask them to do something, I go do it first. So everything I'm gonna walk you through here, I've done myself. And um, let's see here. Yeah. So this, can you all see my cover slide there? I've got um, my contact information on here. I talked to Cecilia from STC. She's going to put, she's taping this and she's going to put this online at the NewMexicoRainforest.com website and all my slides. So you'll have uh, some materials here to refer back to. But one of the, uh, let's see here. One of the first things I want to talk about is right up front, the steps to launch a new business. And what I've got on here is this is actually, this spreadsheet is from the Small Business Development Center. Vic over there gave this to me, who's now a score. And uh, the whole idea was we were trying to explain, okay, what are the pieces of things you, you should have to start a business? So of course, uh, there's an EIN or employee identification number, you should get that established. That basically replaces your social security number and becomes sort of your identity when you're talking with other businesses, in particular vendors and or you're doing projects with somebody and they're going to pay you and your invoice should include that. Uh, you can register your new business up front. You need to do that with the taxation and revenue department so you can start paying your taxes, gross receipts tax. They have a pretty uh, exhaustive set of slides on their website about how to go through and videos on how to use their services and pay. Of course, um, they're trying to make it as easy as they can. It's a little bit laborious, but you can get through it. I got through it. Anybody can get through it. Uh, then the city of Albuquerque, that's the fourth one here. You'll need to get a, uh, if you're in Albuquerque, get a business license. 
when I worked out in Rio Rancho, they of course have a city clerk out there and you can get a, a business license for any of the cities you're in or domains you're living in. And then uh, New Mexico Workforce Solutions, if you have any employees, they ask that either if you don't or not, that you get in there and basically say who your, uh, what your situation is, have you hired folks. And then this other one, the New Mexico Secretary of State, they included this, the, the idea of if you needed to get a trademark, so there's other protections you could add in. What I don't have here is any real information about copyrights and or patents. And that's a whole nother animal. Normally where I send people for patents is I'll send you over to STC, uh, which is the Lobo Rainforest downtown, basically at Central and Broadway. And they will help you walk you through the whole process of getting pat patent. Um, your patent register and or applying for a patent and then getting it registered. I don't have any of those costs. That's a whole different animal. And that gets into some legal stuff. I, I don't know. I've not done a patent, so I really am not the expert at that. The other piece of this is the copyrights, which all of that's another thing are being registered. That can be another thing. But what I would suggest on any of that is that, and then also tax ramifications, that you should have some people in your pool of confidants and people you go to for information. So I invited Larry to come on uh, today just to be there in case we have any legal questions if he didn't disappear on me. You still there, Larry? <laughs> yeah, there he is. Um, yeah, and Larry's somebody I have always trusted to go to for any of this information because he's, a, he's an attorney and he's actually just down the street from um, I think you're at home though today, right, Larry? Yeah, we're all working from home today or yeah. over the My office is oh. down the street from SB is from the STC at the Verge group. So anyways, um, the one thing that was interesting when I went and got my LLC is that you want to, from what I know, and maybe Larry, you might come with this, but you want to do that first because you're basically establishing your name. And if you go into the, uh, do some research on your name and then you find out somebody else has it, you're going to get in a little bit of weirdness there. So you really want to make sure that you're have, have done your homework. You know, you're out there alone. I mean, there's the classic story in New Mexico where we had the double rainbow restaurant up on central. that's now flying star because there was a company that had a double rainbow ice cream in California and they were basically, uh, there was a conflict there with using their name. So I'm going to pop ahead here, but just so you know, uh, at the back of this document, I have, I have here the additional resources. It's the last page, page 10. New Mexico Secretary of State, business name research. If I pop this up, uh, I've, you can go there and put in your name. If you put in my name, Saco, it's going to tell you that there's Saco Connections, which is my company, LLC. And then there's also my brother, Sako Automotive. You'll see several Sakos, including my sister's design. She has uh, architecture. So, But, you know, you want to go look and make sure that your name isn't being used. The other things I put here is this registering your domain name. Once you've established what your name is, generally it's a good thing as soon as possible to get, for my work in this area, is get your domain name to get, you know, if it's for me, it's, I have SakoConnections.com and a couple others. They really upfront don't cost generally that much. If you're looking at something like just for fun, last night I looked at the site and put in a few things that I thought might still be not bought or be out there, like New Mexico Connect.com. Oh my goodness, it's four thousand dollars. Somebody's selling it. So that's why you want to buy your name as soon as you can. In fact, I always recommend and Larry, you may comment, but I, I own stacysacco.com. I think that's important to own your own name. Now, it gets a little weird for me because there's five, six other Stacy Sacos in the United States. They're all women. Uh, one's in uh, real estate in Florida. I've actually called all of them. I'm crazy. And just said, you know, it's, we have the same name. And they're like, what are you calling me for? But it was fun. Um, then there's one other site I wanted to recommend that's on this. If you can see my arrow, I don't know if you see that, but registering your username across different platforms. I think there's other sites that do this, but 
this one's my favorite. If you put in like NM Netlinks is one of my sites. If I put in NM Netlinks, it's going to tell me if, if there's an NM Netlinks on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these other platforms. And so if you're going to be in a consumer market, well, probably a business market too, you want to make sure you own that too. So I went out and I registered for NM Netlinks on Facebook. I own that. LinkedIn. I don't want anybody taking my name and using it in other ways. So probably the sooner the better you get all that set up, but you better know, especially when you go to the city, that are you Saco Connections LLC or Saco Connections, you know, what's the full name? You want to register under that. So the other things I have on this site are a couple books I have. I've got them here. Great books to go to. And then Ultimate LLC, uh, I'm sorry, the UNM Global Rainforest. These are some of the resources they have available and they have, I put in some of their workshops from before and then they have some other ones coming up. So these are great uh, resources for you to tap into. I'll be teaching another workshop in May. I'll just say it real fast. It's going to be up in Taos, but we can pick it up here. I just had to laugh. I, everywhere I go, I run into these people at SPDC and SBA. And now I say, oh, nine out of 10 businesses fail. And I'm like, hey, guys, that's bad news. I don't want to hear that. I'm a happy ending guy. I like Disney movies. So I said, what's the one company that hasn't failed? Well, or of the nine, nine out of 10, well, tell us about the one that isn't failing. Well, it ends up, I did some research. There's um, several hundred businesses that are over a thousand years old on the planet Earth. So the oldest business on the planet is a Japanese company in, uh, I think it's Northern Japan, but they're a construction company. And they, um, have been around since 541 AD. So I'm researching why are these businesses still around? And so that makes for a great uh, presentation about some of the things you'd want to build into your business. Succession planning, maybe an LLC, so you're protecting yourself. That's why you get one of these things. And then I also have the link there to New Mexico networking links. That's my website. I've got almost 4,000 links to resources you can tap into. Uh, the UNM, Global Rainforest has a resource directory too. Great resource, it's got the five categories. So lots of ways to connect into our community. And then uh, New Mexico Economic Development Department, they have a resource directory too. And then Larry, I put your name, num your name on there on the bottom of that page in case somebody wanted to uh, tap into you as an attorney going forward in the future. Oh, that's okay, I didn't ask for your permission to do that. But. I appreciate it. Hey, can I? mention one or two things real quick, Stacy. Let's do it, yes. Um, one is, uh, I was gonna suggest, I don't know if you wanted to add this to your list or not, but I think it's pretty fun, pretty important for new businesses. Yes. One is um, commercial insurance, uh, at, at the very least a general liability policy. Uh, and if, if anything else, talk to a commercial, realist, uh, um, a commercial insurance agent to figure out what kind of policies or coverage you might need depending on the kind of business you're in. Um, that is something that should probably be done sooner rather than later, although I think forming the company should be step number one. Um, as it relates to the trademark, I thought that was really good suggestion about doing the name check there, Stacy. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up that I, I get over and over again on a daily basis is people generally tend to look for the exact match and what I want people to know is it's not an exact match that matters if there's a pre-existing trademark out there. And the example I give is uh, somebody tried to trademark, it was a name similar to Cubed Rojo. And that was declined for trademark infringement against Redbox. And so if you think about how does Redbox and Cubed Rojo, how are they the same from a trademark perspective? And the answer is we care about similarity in look, sound, or meaning. And the reason you want to figure this out now is you don't want to go and, and buy product and inventory and domain names and spend money on branding when your brand might actually infringe on a pre-existing trademark. So it does benefit you to spend a little bit of time to make sure that you're in the clear with your name on similarity in look meaning, and sound. So 
my comment about like this list here, or business name search, when I went on there, I didn't put in Saco Connections LLC or NM Networks. I just put in uh, Saco just to see what shows up. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be part of a bigger name. And that's when, like I say, if you put in Saco, it's going to send you to my brother and sister and anybody other in our family that owns a business. But in fact, it looked, it saw Saco splits out into other words. So it gave me a whole list of different names that were close, but it wasn't the same. And it wasn't like what you're probably describing that this red box had a, must have had something that was fairly familiar. So then you would be infringing. The, the point is, is that you want to do as much research in my mind before you start your business, looking at your name, because it's going to play out in everything, your business cards, what website you buy, your Facebook page. So you want to make sure you've gotten ahead of any potential competitive issues. So, um, hey, see, this is Susan Cornelius. Hey, Susan, how are you? I'm doing fine. One other thing I would add to your and Larry's discussion is that don't use Google to do your search. Right. Use, use DuckDuckGo because Google sells every search and there are people waiting to hear what you're going after. And you, if you search on your, the name you're thinking on using, somebody may buy it and now you're going to pay $1,500, $3,000, $4,000 for it. So for everybody that's here, Susan Cornelius is one of our other instructors and mentors at the Lobo Rainforest. Great resource also. Write her name down <laughs> and come to some of her workshops because she's done a great job on how to get started. She just did a workshop this last week. I think you're doing another one coming up, right? No, I'm all done for the year. I've done well, four the last three weeks, so I'm done with my Zoom workshops. I'll do them again mm -hmm. in the fall. So if anybody wanted to get a hold of you, what you you do consult, I don't know, you know, I didn't know the rest of that story about how you help the community. Do you, you have a consulting business, right? Yes, I do. It's called Accelerate to Solutions. I work with tech companies, uh, taking them from uh, preliminary startup to their first round of funding. Um, right now, I am really focused on working uh, through i which is the innovation yeah. core for UNM under an NSF grant and for the university program at UNM Valencia. And that is where I'm doing a lot of work. Well, I'm so happy you came on board. I was going to send you an email. So if you're available, come join us. You, you beat me. <laughs> I, no, wanted, I wanted you two on like, here, Larry and you. I, I'm, I'm telling all my students that there's some basic bottom line business things they need to take care of. So I'm here. Thank you. Well, in fact, I've heard this, Susan, the same story where somebody said they put, they did some research on a name. And the first time they looked, it was out there under uh, one of these outfits where you can buy the name. And then they waited a few days, and when they went back, somebody bought it. So there's that story. I've heard that story. <clears throat> so Larry's name's at the bottom. I know he'll comment here and there, but I would certainly encourage you to create a relationship with a lawyer at some point when you start your business. And in particular, I'm going to do a little commercial for you, Larry. It's just Larry's background's been really focused on targeting small business. So... Um, He's not paying me to tell you that, not just, but I know. What's that? I said thank you. And Susan, too, a wonderful resource. STC, wonderful resource, especially if you're going to get a patent and all that. So, uh, Kara and uh, Cecilia over there are a great resource. So I'll go back to my second page of my slides, which again are available. Anybody who's joined us since we started. Uh, this is from SBDC, and SCORE originally gave me this. I actually followed up and went up to, when you get an LLC, there's three ways you can buy one. You can go online, sign up for it. It's $50. People used to complain when I worked at West because they'd say, oh, it takes months to get your thing in the mail. So one of the people I was working with signed up for it online and she got it a week, about a week later. So I don't know where that, that's the usual complaint that the government's not following up. No, they are following up and I was very impressed. The other way to do it is to get online and then you can push a button and order it. So it's sent to you FedEx. That's a hundred dollars for a two day delivery and then $150 uh, to get it that day. So because I wanted to see what it was like, I went and drove up to Santa Fe, went to the office and I paid the 150 bucks and I filled out, I have the documents here, which are on these sheets. It's the articles of organization. 
and the rest of the forms I had to fill out. It wasn't a lot, but then they printed out this, which is my LLC certificate. So I'm, I'm ready to go, but they got done in about two hours. It was fun. Actually, I got up there and all the clerks that were helping me were my previous students. So they were giving me a hard time. Like, what are you doing up here? And I'm like, what are you doing up here? So I had about an hour to wait. They sent me across the street to a great restaurant. We can get green chili cheeseburger. So if you really want it, you want to spend the extra money, you know, you can do that. You can also go to a lawyer like uh, Larry and they'll do all this paperwork for you. I generally, for most of the things I do that are legal and especially accounting, the rules change so damn much. I usually go to somebody to have some of this stuff done for me. There's a price you have to pay a little bit extra, but then I know I'm getting um, some inside information and they're take, they're tracking what's going on with the legal aspects of this more than me. So not that it's not that, it's not really that complicated. So well, what I would say is first thing you want to do is do some research, make your name, make sure your name is not being used or you're not infringing on someone else's name. Uh, as Susan was saying, I'd be careful of going to a public website like Google, but you can go to the state's secretary of state who ma basically manages the LLC documentation. So the next sheet I have here is a similar type of list. I had saved this from when I was at West. They take even a sort of a bigger picture look at starting a business, but I liked um, so they'll say, you know, write a business plan. Uh, West has several business plan templates you can use. They also have one of my favorite things that I helped out with when I was there. We were helping people do the financial side of their business. So they were doing, you know, um, cash flow and then an income statement ca uh, balance sheet. The problem is those end up in separate pieces of paper, separate reports. So at West, we created a template you can download that has all of those tied together. So Now, Larry said something that I thought was interesting. I think like right now, there's a big problem, of course, with people having uh, to shut down their businesses because of the distancing and some other issues regarding the pandemic. Well, I wondered, you know, an LLC, part of the reason why you get one, and I'll go into that in a minute, is to protect yourself and give you some, a little bit of a veil of, um, somebody wants to sue you, they're suing the, the LLC, not necessarily you. Now they could break that veil if you're not following some of the rules, but having the LLC gives you some protection. But I think the other thing, I went through about five videos on how to create an LLC last night and boy, oh boy, everybody's pitching the idea that you should have insurance. And that might include business interruption insurance. So Larry, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but I was curious about that, the business interruption insurance, it doesn't replace an LLC in any way, shape or form, right? No, it, it doesn't. What I like to say is um, it's almost like a, you know, like birth control. No one mechanism or thing is, is perfect. And what you want to do is have multiple layers of protection. And with an LLC, what I tell people is treat it like you're having a child, a baby, and that baby is now going to be the business. And it's a baby. It can't sign its name. So you're going to do that on behalf of the baby. But you want to ensure that child. You want to have contracts in place. I did want to mention, even though you, form, you can form an LLC yourself with the state, the state will not give you an operating agreement. And that is a statutorily required document and uh, you can think of it as a partnership agreement between the owners. And if you're by yourself, it's considered a sole member LLC and the uh, operating agreement isn't that important. But if you have one or more partners, you absolutely want to have an operating agreement. And that should be one of the, um, add that as a bullet list here, in my opinion. But uh, insurance would be another form of uh, protection and it, it's interesting, you know, business continuity insurance, uh, disaster recovery, there's a number of different types of policies out there, depending on what kind of business you have and what you're trying to insure against. Another really important form of uh, insurance is key man or key life insurance. And what that does is it's really a life insurance policy against one or more of the owners. And so if you lose an owner, heaven forbid, through a death or incapacity, you can, uh, the company can get an injection of cash 
to either help buy off the estate of the deceased owner and or use that money to hire another key person in the business so that you don't have any interruption that way. Susan, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'd love to hear yes, it. Yes, I do. Um, so our background is as engineers and physicists, and we get our business practice insurance through the IEEE, which is an international engineering association. They work with several insurance companies to offer policies at really good prices. And those are practice insurance, both personal liability and liability in terms of your company. Um, APS, American Physical Society, which is for physicists. So the suggestion is, if there is a student, if you're a student and there's a student version of the, your professional societies you're gonna belong to, uh, when you graduate, um, talk with them as a student entrepreneur about insurance and then talk with them if you're not a student entrepreneur about insurance because they typically work with the big companies and they offer, because they sell so many, they offer the insurance policies at a discounted rate for the members. That's an excellent idea. Yeah, work through some of your organizations that are part of your industry. Um, you know, the other thing I think you mentioned, Larry, it's kind of like with anything in insurance, uh, you sure don't want to be after the fact trying to buy insurance. So you want to get it early. We used to, I used to laugh. Well, I shouldn't be laughing, but when I was in Orange County, my God, if we ever had an earthquake, and I worked at Transamerica Insurance at their national corporate headquarters, and we'd get these uh, calls right after the after the um, earthquake. Oh my God, can I buy insurance? It's like, no, <laughs> the earthquake already happened. You know, and you can't buy it after. You have to buy it ahead of time. So it's kind of a bet on uh, you know it's gambling in its own weird way. But you certainly don't want to gamble your whole business because something happens and you didn't think ahead to think about what some possible outcome. So getting insurance is part and parcel of this whole idea, which I'll go through in a minute of why you get an LLC, there's a reason, but it's really about protection and about uh, strengthening your business, um, supporting your business. So if something happens, uh, you have uh, a legal recourse. So any other comments, Larry? Um, you, you touched on something else. Um, you didn't say it, I don't think. Piercing the corporate veil. Yeah. Um, that is, that's really, in LLC, if you operate through the LLC, and, and what do I mean by that? The LLC is doing business. So, for example, you lease a premise or a space. You want the LLC to be the tenant, not yourself. And because if you're yourself as the tenant, then you're responsible to the landlord personally. If you have the LLC as the tenant, then it's the LLCs that's responsible. Uh, I'm not talking about personal guarantees, by the way. That's a separate issue. But you want the LLC to be the named party in various relationships. When you do that, if there's a problem, then the LLC gets sued, not you personally. There is an exception to that, though, called the... Uh, the doctrine of uh, piercing the corporate veil. And there's a number of different ways to do that. It's really hard to do, but the two most common ways to do it is commingling funds, which we don't have to discuss too much, but you can Google that, or um, duck, duck, go, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. What I was gonna say is, I definitely encourage my students when they start a business, is keep, you know, you have a business account that's separate from your normal personal checking account. So then you, if you're paying for anything, you actually, uh, how would I do this? You might actually write a check on your, well, this is gonna sound weird, but you make sure that all the final payments through the business account. So you, that's where the final check comes from. That's right. If, if, you put it on your, your accounting, accounting records. That's right. Well, if the business needs money, you can certainly loan the business money. Exactly. What you don't want to do is have the business writing personal checks. So like to your mortgage, your cell phone, stuff like that, groceries. You, you don't want your business to do that. And if your business needs money, don't write a personal check for the business. Um, the, the second way that piercing the corporate veil happens a lot is not following corporate formalities. And what does that mean? Well, that's back to the operating agreement again. And if you don't have an operating agreement, you got to look at the statute. 
And so unless everybody here is familiar with the New Mexico Limited Liability Company Act and the requirements of that act, you should have an operating agreement that you can refer to and controls how you manage the company, such as how you borrow funds, uh, how you let members come or go, how you indemnify people, that would be in the operating agreement. And if you don't follow that, then you can open yourself up to a piercing the corporate veil uh, argument by a plaintiff. So let me go to the next slide here, because I think it, it starts to speak to some of that. Um, well, there's, I'm sorry, a couple more slides. I'll just say this real fast. There's lots of different legal structures for a business. This is right out of one of my books in my uh, new venture strategies class. Of course, the bottom one is limited liability. Li limited liability. Why do you want to do it is because it um, gives you some liability. So if somebody goes to sue you, like Larry was saying, um, you're basically in, uh, taxed once. If you're a Inc. or incorporated, then you have, I think there's two tax levels and there's less rules than, I know one of my buddies has always given me a hard time saying, you should be an S corporation. But when I looked at his accounting, it's a lot more complicated. I thought, I'll just stay in LLC for that reason. But there are other things that, uh, here's another description of comparing the different kinds of legal entities. And the LLC is the simplest of all these, interesting enough, well, other than sole proprietor not being a uh, LLC. But I okay. think the LLC gives you that additional uh, uh, wall in a way, if somebody's going to sue you, that they'll sue that, which is why you want to do all your business under the name of the LLC. So you might, article, Stacey, okay. sorry to interrupt. Can I mention a couple of quick things on that? Oh, if, yeah, yeah. Can you go back to that slide real quickly? Yeah. If, if I were to summarize this, I'd say there's three types of entities. One is a non-entity, which would be a sole proprietorship or partnership. And that's just, a, you're doing business and there's no structure to it. And there's a lot of liability that can attach personally. The other two types of entities are corporations or the LLC or limited liability company. Now, a lot of people get confused because people will talk about C Corp or corporation or S Corp. Yep. That's really a tax status. So you can have a corporation or an LLC and either one of those can be taxed under subchapter S or subchapter C. The LLC is a little more flexible because you get two additional tax statuses with it. You can have what's called disregarded if it's a sole member or it's owned by just a husband and wife in a community property state like New Mexico. And that would be like a sole proprietorship. You report all your income on your Schedule C. The other option you get with a limited liability company is a partnership. And so the partnership is a form of pass-through income like an S corporation is, but there's different tax rules that apply. S corp is really the most popular for a multi-member or multi-owner company. And when you talk to an accountant and an accountant says S corp, make sure you ask the accountant, are we talking about a corporation or an LLC? And usually they're not talking about either. They're just talking about the tax status. Well, and that's, uh, I kind of alluded to that. One of my friends owns, he's got, he's set up as an S and I guess he makes more money on the back end. It's, it's less, the way he's figured it out is it's lower tax. So he's always giving me a hard time. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Okay, I'm listening. Show me what you do. And then when he showed me all the paperwork, I'm like, what? I mean, it was crazy. It was a whole nother level of accounting. And, you know, I'm teaching. I mean, I've got 20 things going. So to me, that just seemed like a big uphill battle for not a lot of money. Well, you could save 15.2% on self-employment tax. So it really depends on how much money you're making. And right. that money can add up. Yeah, and in this case, I on the my my business on the side is part time extra work. It's you know consulting, so it's not going to be a lot. But for somebody that's that's their main company, well, you probably want to shop around or look at all these different options in terms of a legal structure. And again, I would probably call somebody a legal uh, a lawyer or some outfit where they can give you some very specific updated laws in terms of what your options are because again and you can speak to that Larry do these laws change quite a bit or they they're not staying the same every year right oh no they change a lot although the tax rules are are really where the big changes are 
like for instance, uh, Trump's 2017 Tax Reform Act that, um, that didn't really help professionals like lawyers like myself, but it does help in a lot of other areas, depending on where or how you spend your money. Right. But those rules are changing very frequently. And then of course we got the PPP funding, you know, the, um, the paycheck protection program with the SBA and um, believe it or not, there's some tax issues there, even though they say that it's, um, it's could be potentially forgiven and potentially not reportable as income, but it's not a for sure thing. So that's yeah, fine. I was surprised when they said that. In fact, we had a lot of people coming to me as the head of the Small Business Institute and saying, can we get student teams to consult on this for small businesses? And I'm like, no way, no way. <laughs> Sir, we'd be reading what we're, you know, they're putting out, but I don't want to have any student liable for that. I think you really got to take all this stuff to the next level. So it, it pays to have somebody in your, on your team that knows what they're talking about. So, um, so this was, I thought, a good part of the one thing I found in my book. Then the other thing I did was back to this articles of organization. I have mine for my group, my business. But, and I was going to put them on here and I thought, well, wait a minute, I've got all kinds of numbers on there, social security, EIN, and I thought, I, I didn't want to necessarily share that. So I just cut it up and said, here's the typical things that are on that. You create this articles of organization to say how you're going to run your business. And by the way, you mentioned partnerships and I thought I better say a lot of people are starting partnerships, which is great. They're couples, whatever. But when I was at West again, boy, we had horror stories about people starting a partnership and then not getting agreements about who gets paid what, if something goes sideways, who's supposed to be responsible for this or that. I even started a partnership at, the, at Pepperdine when I was in college. And my buddy and I started a little business. Well, it was pretty obvious right in the beginning of it. He's getting all the money and I'm doing all the work. At least that was my opinion. So I bought him out. We're still, and I said, I'm going to be your best friend forever. But we need to not run a business together, dude. So we didn't do that. But now in retrospect, I think we could have done very well if we had put everything in writing. So having as much as you can, you know, just having, um, you know, what are the parameters in terms of what, who's doing what and how people can get paid and then the whole chain of events that might happen, you've thought it through. So you're not all of a sudden uh, six months into it going, why am I doing all the work, you know? There, that's a, exactly right. I think there's three reasons why I don't think anybody should do a partnership ever. And reason one is what you said. There's, as things get better or if they get worse, then you have finger pointing, friends, family members start fighting with each other. It's unless you write it down and have a formal mechanism, you're just asking for trouble. The yeah. second problem is liability. Um, if your partner is driving somewhere in furtherance of the company and gets into an accident and hurts somebody, you're personally liable for that, even though you had nothing to do with the traffic accident. And then the third issue that a lot of people don't think about is, is if something happens to one of the partners and they become, you know, they die or become incapacitated, the partnership dies immediately upon the death of either partner. So it ceases to exist and creates all kinds of problems with assets and bank accounts and contracts and so on. So I do not encourage a partnership at all. Well, so just to move on with that for a second. Oops. Shut my phone off, sorry. Um, you know, because I, I would say that at West. I'd have people come in and I'd go, oh, you know, let me see your, what you've got in writing. And then we try to work this out. And I'd say, go see a lawyer, make sure you're cool. But then I'd look outside and I and I'd go, well, wait a minute, you got companies like Google, where these three, four guys started this thing. You've got all kinds of interesting stories all this throughout this country where people have started these businesses and they're doing very well. And I'm like, how the heck are they doing it? And you've got little companies in New Mexico that are exploding, you know, or imploding one way, one direction or the other. So I thought there's gotta be some mechanism where that seems to work. I just haven't figured it out. So I mean, maybe you've seen it. I because I always would discourage people from doing a partnership too, and that's the same with LLC. You can get an LLC partnership or partner, and I would be, oh, uh, I just, 
you want to go in with your eyes open and you want to have things thought through. And um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. What I tell people is if you want to have a partnership, that's fine. Just do it under an LLC. It's very inexpensive, easy to set up, very formal, um, but just an informal partnership. And you got to be careful because in the state of New Mexico, it's called a de facto partnership. The moment you have two or more people saying, hey, that sounds like a great idea, and somebody goes and does something, research, goes, talks to people, it's in furtherance of a partnership. You have a de facto partnership, and you are now liable if somebody gets in a traffic accident or there's another problem. So we've got about 20 minutes. So let me just cut to the chase on a few little parts of this. That The first couple of pages of this talk about, you know, where do you get your LLC? There's the three ways. You can pay the $50, do it online. Wait a couple of weeks, you'll get your paperwork. You can get it FedEx to you for another $100. And then, or I think it's $75. Where is that? Oh, no, it's $50 more. So it's $100 for two day, which is FedEx. And then $150 if you want it that same day, which is what I did. And they were very great up there in Santa Fe, very helpful. But you know, that's all dependent on what you're trying to do. Probably what I'd recommend is the $50 and just get it sent to you, you're, you'll get it. <clears throat> um, once you've established your LLC as part of that, you need to have this articles of organization. I have another document I'm not showing you that is much more detail about when we meet as a board, who's on the team, who's managing this. And then that becomes the third piece of this, which is, and so these are, this is my paperwork and that I filled out when I went to Santa Fe, just to show you. It's basically, you know, certain, it's basically that same list. Who's the uh, designee, what's the address, et cetera, what's your name? And then this is what they sent me to say, you're, you're a company. The other, um, and then here's those resources. The other piece of this is that, and I've met as a board outside of uh, running the business where I've brought in, basically I document what I've done, my finances, and then I work with my wife and we have a meeting and then we have minutes of that meeting so that we look like a legitimate company. Well, we are a legitimate company, but there's a piece of this that you have to remember that once you start an LLC, you need to do some additional paperwork at infinitum going forward. And that has to happen or the LLC gets disqualified. So any comments on that would be interesting from you, Larry, about the follow-up and what do you do to maintain the LLC? Well, in general, it, it does um, whatever your operating agreement says in terms of having annual meetings. Uh, fortunately, in New Mexico, there is not a um, reporting requirement. Uh, if you have a corporation, you would have to submit what's called biannual reports that most people forget about, and then they close the company, and then you got to pay an outrageous fee to get it reinstated. Fortunately, LLCs don't have that. But whether uh, you go by statute or operating agreement, you should have an annual meeting at the very least. Yep. Uh, and then if you're going to do something important, um, borrow a lot of money, buy some real estate, sell a significant asset, bring on a new member. Uh, you should have a, a meeting and a vote on something like that. And then what you do is you write down some sort of corporate resolution. What did the members vote on? What did they decide? Just document that and put it in your three ring binder for the company so that you have this history of the company. That's really what you need to maintain it. And then, um, yeah. That's my three ring binder right there. <laughs> But yeah, you're, what was interesting was I thought when I first did it that I had to report all this stuff because I, you know, worked in major companies. And no, it's the state, and that's part of why it's such a great program is that you have the benefits, but not as much work as you would if you were incorporated as a corporation. So, but you still need to document that. So I have a file for all that, our meetings and who who was there and, you know, what did we talk about? And it's not that substantial, but it's not something I have to then send into the state and make sure, verify something with them, so. That's right. And it's one of the other advantages of the LLC is if, you know, heaven forbid, you know, you talk about a, what, over a 90% failure rate, right, over, after three years, it's not difficult to close or dissolve the LLC either. A corporation, big pain in the butt. You got to go and get a tax, uh, tax certification, you got to get, um, what, with, 
New Mexico tax and rev. You got to make sure you don't have any gross outstanding gross receipts tax. You got to get certifications, submit it. You know, there's a whole process you got to follow that adds cost and expense to that too. So let me kind of end on a note is that the reason a lot of people were encouraging me to get an LLC originally was if somebody were to sue me, you know, my wife worked at Sandia, owns a winery. So they, they'd sue me, but they'd be going after her because that's where the money is. So I'm trying to do my best to protect the family from any of that. Now, of course, I'm just a consultant, so there's probably not much you're going to do to sue me. But the one guy I was working with, he was a plumber. Oh, he went in and fixed somebody's pipes and the pipes broke and then it flooded their basement. Well, it killed their TV and some other furniture. So he was liable for that. Now, of course, insurance would probably cover a lot of that. So that's, again, it's about risk reward. But the LLC uh, helped protect him from some of the suits that were coming his way because in a way they could sue the LLC for what money it had, but his deep pockets were somewhat protected. Now, again, you don't want to do something where they can break that veil or cut through that. But uh, it's probably some good lawyer out there. I'm looking at you, Larry. <laughs> some yeah. good lawyer out there might figure out a way around it. But so you want to make sure you take care of yourself. But that's the reason you spend the 50 bucks is to have more of a protection for your business. So I think there's value in doing it. I did it for myself, even though as a consultant, and I'm doing training, uh, you know, I'm not going to have a pipe burst. So I get it. But depending on what kind of business you have, you might want to protect yourself around what some of the contingencies could be. You know, Stacy, you brought up a really good point, by the way. I just want to reiterate. Um, insurance, that's why you get insurance. But you also need to recognize or know that insurance does not cover intentional acts. And I'm going to give you one example of where that was a problem for a client of ours. Uh, I had a client who did um, uh, flips with homes. And so he had a, a, a rehab where they pretty much gutted the entire place. And they hired a contractor to go and do the, you know, the, the, the complete remodel and, and every, the restoration of this home. And they had a, uh, a chain link fence surrounding the property. And the vendor at night didn't fully close and lock the front gate and it allowed some kids to sneak into the property at night, and one of them got electrocuted. Uh -oh. And it was a terrible situation. And the insurance company said, intentional act. You intentionally left the gate unlocked. And, of course, my client's like, I didn't leave the gate unlocked. My contractor left the gate unlocked. The insurance company doesn't care. And so now my company is fighting with the contractor to figure out who's responsible for this. But it would be really good you know, if you had a problem like that, to have an LLC in place to help minimize personal liability in a, in a problem like that. So what I, for people who came in a little bit after the beginning, the document we have here will be online. Uh, Cecilia from STC is going to post all this. And so there's, it's not sort of a checklist, but sort of about what do you need to do to get an LLC? It's you know, there's two or three documents you've got to put together and you want to do some research to make sure you're not infringing on somebody else's name or you're using a competitor's name. And then I gave you some additional links here to check for your website. And then is, if there's your name is being used in Facebook or whatever, because you want to make sure you own all that too. And then I gave you Larry's uh, email here or website. So, cause he is a, a small business lawyer here in Albuquerque, Susan, since we're coming to the conclusion here, Susan, you have anything else you want to add? At the STC, we focus on designing your company. Um, most of it is tech companies, okay, biomedical companies. And we start off with customer discovery. Before we're ready to launch a prototype and make any claims about what our product can do, that is about the timing that we're looking at getting all your business paperwork filed. Is, do you guys concur? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, you want to have a, well, I think what's the latest, it's funny, at, at Anderson School of Management, the other teachers tend to have students do a business plan, and I'm taking everything I got out of your workshop, Susan, and have them do a business model canvas. So uh, remember her name, everybody that's on this uh, call here today or on this workshop, because she runs some other workshops that are a huge resource. Um, 
So stay in touch with her. And then Larry, do you have any workshops coming up or anything? Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. No, and I should, but uh, well, actually, now I think about it, I'm on a, um, the ESPN channel. I'm going to be on for an hour tomorrow answering uh, business questions, especially around COVID and what is a, um, uh, it, what is it, a essential versus non-essential business and how to deal with PPP funds and stuff like that. But other than that, it's more like we just help people individually or, you know, and, uh, but I don't have anything to announce, uh, you know, workshop wise, I'm sorry. Do you give everybody a first half hour free kind of thing and then to kind of assess where their needs are? Well, if they're, re if they're related to you or West, a half hour, otherwise three 15 minutes. Okay. And so you're on TV, you're a celebrity. We didn't know. Oh yeah. I'm a huge celebrity. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Delighted you and Susan show, came today, and then I know Cecilia's on here from STC. They're going to do a workshop. If you can pop in, uh, Cecilia, about I know C Craig White's doing a workshop on COVID also. Well, it's yeah. Underwear. So yeah. we'll be having another one of these virtual seminars um, on Thursday at two. I believe it's at two thirty. Um, but it'll also be um, a Zoom meeting with Craig White and he'll be going over various resources available for small businesses um, regarding um, anyone who's been affected by COVID-19. So um, Larry and that'll be this Thursday. I think Larry it's at Talking talk about that earlier, there's a lot of um, details involved in that. So going to a workshop like that or getting some advice on how to apply for these things is important because you don't want to part of it's certain monies need to be spent for certain things and you need to document it a certain way and so a little bit of that we've still got a few minutes if anybody that's here we've got a lot of people online if you want to just unmute yourself i can't see all of you and just throw a question out we'd lo love to have it like an auctioneer going going gone <laughs> any questions out there uh, stacy uh this is dale alverson yes can you, can you hear me yes sir what's this question is dale alverson. uh it's often the case and uh, maybe others are in the same situation back uh, a few years ago i formed an llc and uh but didn't do all these steps that you just talked about it's sort of like the horse out of the barn kind oh, of yeah, well. phenomena, but it, seem, it seems to me that I could still go back and check these things out. And then I'm particularly uh, interested in this whole idea of commercial insurance and liability coverage. I haven't had to face any issues in that regard, but so any advice about those of us already went through some of those steps with the state, formed an LLC, but really didn't do all these other things. So you asked, the question is, can you go back and remedy that? Is that what you're? Right, right. Or do I need to, to, uh, <clears throat> to talk to Larry? <laughs> the, yeah, well. the, nothing, not, nothing is really, nothing has happened that's negative, but you know, in this day and age, I know things can happen. And I have people that are sort of working with me. So I, when I hear this thing about sort of by de facto, they become partners. Uh, it, it seems to me there's a lot of issues I haven't addressed. So the question is, how do you remedy it? Or do I uh, like engage your, somebody like Larry Donahue? So, and, I, and that's what I'm hearing if, if, if I'm hearing this is that, and I'm guessing that you don't have an operating agreement. You don't have some of those things in place. You haven't met. And so can you go back and sort of fill in those, that gap or blanks? That's probably yeah, the ideal, thank exactly. you. Larry, is that what were you're saying? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think yeah, that, that's, I'm sorry, Stacy. did you want me to answer that or? Yeah, Larry, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no, the, um, the, yes, I have some comments. The quick um, answer is absolutely. The more you could do to patch in the uh, gaps in how you've created or set up your company, the sooner 
is always the better. As it relates to partnerships or other partners and people, um, the quick little story I would give is I have two conference rooms in my law firm, and they both have tissue paper <laughs> on the conference room table. And of the hundreds of different matters I deal with, you know, on a quarterly basis, the tissue paper is used when we deal with partnership disputes. And partnership disputes usually come up because there wasn't a, a written document indicating who owns what. And so if you have key employees or people that are expecting some level of ownership, you probably should, this is a good time to give it to them with the right operating agreement and other conditions of that ownership. For example, if you have to terminate somebody, do you get to buy their ownership back or do they get to keep it? If they, uh, heaven forbid, die or become incapacitated, does your company get to buy the ownership back from the estate or are, is the estate or family members now one of your partners? So you really need to get that figured out very quickly. And, and I hope you don't have any disputes with anybody saying, hey, wait a minute, I thought I was going to get 50%, not 10% or, or whatever. So you really need to, to hammer those issues out sooner rather than later before the company becomes more valuable. You know, and Dale, real quick, another comment, and maybe Susan is running into this too, but at, certainly at West, and I don't mean to pick on West, but it was just one of my experiences where I met two, three business owners every week, helped them do a business plan. There was a lot of people I'm meeting with different issues. Well, one of the issues that came up a lot was I had one gentleman come in, he's been making cowboy boots and selling them for like two, three years. And he came in and I said, so let me see your financials. I says, you don't have any taxes in here. Have you ever paid taxes? He goes, taxes oh and i'm like oh oh my god so i called the tax and revenue department and i said hey here's what's going on and you know what if you didn't call them and you let them call you i think that's a problem or if it's millions of dollars they're probably going to find you anyways but you don't want to make make them hunt you down I went to this lady up there and she said, oh, no, thank you for calling. Let's go through it. And she spent hours with this gentleman and I on the phone, figured out his fine was about $35 because he wasn't making that much. But, you know, he had $5 for each time he was supposed to pay. It was a fine. And then his taxes were just not that high. So it was about $50. But anyways, I she was so pleasant. And she actually, I was cracking up. She stayed after five to help us. Uh, and I thought, aren't you supposed to be ending your day? She goes, no, I want to help you. And I'm like, what? Tax and revenue department is going to stay on the line. She didn't beat us up. She was very generous. I found that in most cases, if you're willing to put it all out there and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. Help me. They're more than happy to have you come to them and, and solve that problem with them. They just don't want you to try to hide anything. And I don't know if that's on the legal side of anything, Larry, but or Susan, if you've had that experience. But I tell you, for me, I was so pleasantly surprised by the government and how they responded to that thing is that we hadn't had, this gentleman had not put all those things in place. And that's maybe not really your situation, Dale, but it's similar in that there's stuff you need to have done. You didn't, well, okay, get it in place. And then just let people know, I didn't know. And I think you, you know, nobody's gonna, at least what I saw was people weren't beating him up. They were more than happy to ha have that dialogue. You, I just want to say that um, I've had a client, to give you an example, where uh, they underpaid their gross receipts tax of approximately 80 grand. And the New Mexico Tax and Rev figured this out. They didn't. And when New Mexico Tax and Rev came after them, they came after them for penalties and interest, which was over a quarter million dollars. Uh -oh. so think about that. From an $80,000 miscalculation of gross receipts tax, turns into over, you know, around $260,000 uh, of an obligation to New Mexico tax and rent. So if you know you owe gross receipts tax, you definitely want to be the one going to them versus them coming to you. Well, I, I think that was my point is that you, you need to take proactively move on these things. Now, my situations were always very small, small, small micro businesses. So it wasn't the other 80,000. I'm sure that gets in a different league, but Anyways, anybody out, Dale, did we answer your question? No, that, that's very helpful. And I, there's a lot of things I think I need to do to remedy before I have a problem, yeah. like your earthquake 
analogy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but just you know, I am registered. I'm paying gross receipts taxes, and uh, and there are 1099s as a consultant through my yeah. business. So there's there's cross checking. One of the things that it's a detail, but uh, on my 1099s, one of the companies I work with as a consultant included my gross receipts tax. You know, I, I charge them consultant fee plus the gross receipts tax and my 1099 included it. So there was a discrepancy between what the 1099 said and what I actually said were my gross receipts. So there are little details like that, but you no, know, it's, I, I think it's been helpful to me and maybe to others on the call to do what I need to do uh, to make sure I fill the gaps that exist. Thank you. So for anybody else that's online, 1099 is a form you, uh, there's also a W9 or I9, you fill out when you collect money. When I do a project for somebody, I need to give them my information so they report that they paid me so they can write it off as an expense. Well, now it's an income to me, so I better have taxes that tie back to that income. And so they're like Dale said, there's this cross check. So, you know, it's not big brother so much, but they're watching and they want to make sure that you're legitimately paying your taxes on what you earn. So, okay. So you pay. That's what you do. Um, anybody else? One last quick question. Anybody in, on the, on the call? Just open up, unmute and come on. So, uh, my information is going to be on this. Uh, I put in Larry's website. You can check that out. Susan, I don't have your information if she's still on. Another great resource. Thank you, Susan, for coming. Cecilia, thank you for setting us up. Larry, special thank you to you for being here today. And um, everybody for joining us. There's other workshops coming up. I'm certainly available at UNM. My information's on the front page. I also head up the Small Business Institute. So if you needed a team of students you wanted to tie to or needed to bring, wanted to bring in some interns, I'm happy to help with some of that too. So stay in touch with me on that. Any last words, Larry, since I'm looking at you? <laughs> um, no, I just want to tell everybody good luck uh, with your business and what you have going on. I do want to tell you though that uh, the COVID situation has really, just about everybody is taking a pause. Um, the, the uncertainty, I think if you ask what does a business need, it's certainty. You need to be able to plan and predict and figure out where your business is coming from. We don't quite have that right now. Um, and so if I can be political, I'm not, gonna, I'm not a D or an R, but we need planning and we need predictability. So if we can get that from the feds and the state and maybe coordinate, I think that'll help us small businesses figure out when to start hiring people back, when to start committing more funds. And uh, I do want everybody to be careful in investing a lot of money, at least right now. Um, I have people looking at leases, and I gotta tell you, our recommendation is to wait a little bit until we get a little bit more certainty in the marketplace. Yeah, it's a tough time. I've been home for about a month, and I was named one of the better networkers in the city. I've had people call me and say, are you seeing a therapist? How are you doing there, dude? like oh my god I'm not out but I'm meeting people online so it's been I've been all my classes have been great everybody's been really helpful at UNM especially STC and all they've done so stay in touch with them their websites on here also so lots of wonderful resources a lot of people here to help all of us through a lot of what's going on right now so um, I think uh, Cecilia if you can you're, you're I think still the host of this will end the meeting Again, um, we're getting rated right our time, so I'd like to end on time. I always like to do that. Start on time, end on time. Thank you again, Larry. Thank Dale for your question. Thank you, Cecilia, for helping us run this today. And uh, let's all stay in touch. Anything we can do to help you, just, our information's there. Give us a call.